Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coopcast, another very special episode in which I reached out to you, the community, on Twitter, on Instagram, and through my SpeakPipe channel on what questions you wanted me to answer for you. I cannot tell you how much fun I had combing through all of these, and I had to I had to pick two. That's all I could handle for this particular episode. So I appreciate everybody that did contribute. I'm sorry that I did not get to them. I promise I'm going to try to get to them in the future, whether it's through this podcast or whether it's through the Wednesday Wisdom Forum that I offer out on Instagram. You guys should check that out every Wednesday morning. You can ask me anything and I will try to answer it. But this episode of the podcast centers around two particular questions. The first one of which is how much adversity training should you actually be doing in training? This is a really big topic. It's one that I'm very passionate about and it's all too cliche now to talk about these things like grit and suck it up and everybody wants to just tough it out and goggins through it. So first and foremost, I wanted to put my coaching hat on and determine how we can in the most efficacious manner possible incorporate adversity training with an athlete for any particular circumstance. Second question is a nutrition one. This is one that came up a lot on Twitter in Twitter in a lot of different flavors. And this is, should you separate your hydration from your calories or should you go with a one source fits all solution like a Roctane or some other sort of high calorie type of drink? We see a lot of athletes do this and they kind of purport that this is a great way to do it in a lot of interviews. And so I go through what I think about that particular strategy in the second part of this podcast. So sit back, have a listen, and get right out of the way. Here is the Ask Me Anything episode of the Coopcast. Once again, I can't thank you guys enough for participating in this. It really was a hoot for me. Here we go. All right, we are going to get into our first question, and this is from longtime listener and Coopcast fan. This is from Mark, and it is all about this really curious aspect of training that I actually have changed my philosophy on over the course of my career. And I'm going to go over that in just a little bit. And that is how do we deal with adversity training and training for toughness? Here is Mark's question. Question. Hey Coop, I know you love the question. How long should my longest run be before my 50 K 50 mile, hundred miler, but One thing I do think that is important, at least for me, is learning on those epic long runs that things are hard. I need that dose of humility and perspective before I go do something super big. So how do you get that in a long run if it isn't the thing that you're doing itself? All right. Really cool question. I appreciate you uh, tuning into the Coopcast, Mark, and and submitting that question. And as I mentioned from the onset, this is something that I have changed my philosophy on over the course of my coaching career. And let me give the listeners a little bit of a perspective on that before I go into this answer proper. My traditional coaching background and the way that I was essentially brought up as a coach was from a really strict physiological lens. I came into this environment where we had a lot of coaches that were from the Olympic Training Center, and their primary focus was to optimize physiology. And as a consequence to that, the way that we set up workouts and the way that we set up training architecture was almost solely revolved around creating the exact ideal situation to produce the best physiological result. And so we were always arranging workouts and arranging training blocks in that particular manner where we were trying to optimize specifically the workload for that one one particular bout of training or the workload over the course of several weeks in order to achieve some sort of optimal physiological response. And we could measure that physiological response in the lab with tools out in the field. And that strategy really permeated through to a lot of my training that I, that I uh, gave to my athletes when I was in my 20s and my 30s. And then when I started to coach ultramarathon runners, I started to realize that there was this aspect of ultramarathon performance 
that really superseded the physiology that you could achieve with training. Athletes absolutely needed to be able to handle tough and challenging and changing mainly environmental conditions, but also competition uh, conditions as well. And so what I started to think about is how can I as a coach deliberately deliver training that would at the same time maximize or at least improve physiology as well as include this element of training for adversity or toughness training. And certainly it is a tricky aspect to get right because you can't always just throw hard stuff at athletes and have them succeed time and time again. You need a mix of training that is trying to optimize physiology as well as training that is trying to induce some sort of so, some sort of condition that the athlete is going to have to experience some amount of adversity in order in order to overcome and it's not as simple as balancing this ideal physiology versus this toughness training because there is a venn diagram overlap between the two but make no mistake you can't you can't optimally optimally do both with the exact same architecture and i can pick apart individual training sessions and I can pick apart uh, uh, a training structure that covers months and even years and say, well, this one is going to optimize physiology and this one is going to optimize this other area of performance. And it's really the confluence of all of those different variables that creates an effective training program. It's not just one or the other. And I will say that in my observation of a lot of athletes, and in particular, a lot of elite athletes, they mess this up all the time. And the very classic example is the athlete that refuses to run in the rain and the cold and the snow, and they are always getting on their treadmill in the vein of wanting to optimize their workout. They can't stand running at a mile, a minute per mile or two minutes per mile slower than they normally would and they don't want to layer up and deal with the icy conditions and things like that. And so they essentially relegate themselves to running on the treadmill for sometimes months. And we see this here in Colorado a lot when the weather turns very nasty and the people up in the Pacific Northwest see this as well. And I always look at that and say, OK, you're doing a great job of optimizing your training for your physiology specifically. But are you doing enough training to optimize your capabilities to adapt to different environments and to adapt to when you actually need to be tough. And what I will say is at the elite level, their physiology is already optimized pretty, pretty darn well. Those athletes are very good. And so turning the screws even more so on days where you have the opportunity to do some toughness training or to do some adversity training, I think in many cases is a big mistake because those athletes are already good enough anyway, and you might only be able to optimize physiology a very, very, very small fraction of a percentage with that one particular workout, but you have the opportunity to toughness train or to train for different environmental conditions uh, so so very infrequently compared to the really good days that you have that you should do anything you can to take advantage of those bad days. We see this play out in the field of competition, for example, a few years ago at UTMB where the weather was particularly bad and a lot of athletes didn't know how to cope with those bad conditions, when to put on their rain jacket, when to take off their rain jacket, when to take an extra 30 seconds to put on extra warm clothing and things like that. It's those types of things that end up mattering just as much, if not more, in an ultramarathon setting as compared to the classic physiological things that we're trying to improve, like your VO2 max, pace at power at lactate threshold, and all of those other things. And so I use that as a little bit of a preamble that athletes would be are, are very well served to consider both training that optimizes their physiology but also training that that allows them or enhances their ability to deal with tough conditions and to deal with conditions where they're going to adapt. And many times that training is in opposition to one another. 
meaning you are going to have to substitute what could be a perfect physiological workout for a workout that is specifically intended on training for toughness. Interestingly enough, just last week, I talked with sports psychologist Kareem Ramadan about this, and we brought this element up very specifically, and I'm going to play a short uh, four or five minute clip from him and get his perspective on exactly what this what this equilibrium or this balance needs to be between toughness or adversity training and training for the optimal physiological state. I like the athlete to be mentally aware of, like I'm doing what I like, I'm doing what leads me to a good state. Okay, so what I'm getting from you is, is you're trying to set up the entire environment based on previous behaviors and previous patterns in order to kind of like stay out of this negative space in the first place. So yeah. this is, and I've heard, I've heard a lot of sports psychologists kind of talk about that, that environmental, you're looking at the whole environment, right? Training partners, yeah. time of day, what you're eating, all these things you're trying to make conducive to the training session and the, and the kind of the athlete as a whole. My thought always goes to overload and adaptation though. Cause that's my, that's my background, right? It's more of a physiological yeah. construct. And when I hear this, we're trying to create this utopian environment for the athlete. The thing that, that my mind drifts towards is reality isn't like that. And they need to be able to cope with stressful and unideal environments, just as they need to be able to know how to set up the environment to thrive. And I, I'm wondering how, like, how you balance that because they, they do seem, and, and the listeners are probably, you know, thinking about this in their heads right now, those do seem at kind of like polar opposite types of, of construct where there are times where I want an athlete to be able to work out and to perform in an unideal or a hostile type of environment, right? Just so they can learn that they can get over whatever they need to, they need, they need to get over. That's almost on the polar opposite of we want to wake up at the perfect time every day and have rice instead of pasta and like create this, like, you know, like I said, this utopian environment. So I'm wondering like what your thoughts are on that kind of like bifurcation of, of, of strategies that you see out there a lot in practice with coaches and with athletes. Uh, it is a thin line to make a certain balance. Uh, it's important to do both. It's important to be aware of what suits you most, but also it's important every now and then to do something uncomfortable, to train at uh, an hour that you dislike, to train with someone that you dislike, because in competition, if you're a competitive athlete, you're going to be racing sometimes with people that are going to push the effort from the beginning. You kind of want to stick with them. It's it's a lot of elements. but to challenge ourselves with environmental factors or uh, mental factors, I like to do it consciously with the athlete, like to tell them, okay, we're going to do this to feel uncomfortable and to see how to deal with it. But every now and then, like once a week, once every two weeks, because for the amateur athlete, they, they want to enjoy the activity. So yeah. you kind of want them to collect things that allow them to enjoy but for an intermediate level athlete uh, actually more than the elite because the elite already has been through a lot the intermediate athlete needs to be more conscious about those and to know okay this element or this situation makes me uncomfortable we're gonna have to do it every now and then to adapt more uh, some of the athletes that i work with and get amazed by how much they deal well with the uncomfortable are um, professional alpinists, they deal with brutal environments. In their case, it's very hard to put something that suits you very well. In, in alpinism, you might end up climbing 20 days, uh, sorry, 20 hours straight, sometimes staying in the tent and not climbing for four or five days. So in that case, we really need to highlight what suits them or something that brings them comfort. Uh, it could be a comfort meal, like a little candy bar that they keep with for emergency situations. Or I've had this case of this athlete that uh, took with him on his expedition uh, a sample of his favorite perfume. It just made him feel fresh. <laughs> on, let's say, summer day, he felt fresh. I mean, two months without shower. 
uh, it really made him feel nice. So collecting these little things in such extreme cases, it's a very important practice. So, he, so here's here's what I think is really important from that from that example right there is the amount of adversity training we'll call it that we'll put the we'll put that in a bucket right where you're intentionally asking or athletes are intentionally asking of themselves to go out into a harsh unideal environment and go and train and, and go and compete the amount that you're asking the athletes to do that in training is somewhat proportional to what they need to experience during in the field of competition or, or kind of during a task. So your alpinists need to do it more than your endurance athletes who they're still, cre- they're still competing in harsh environments, but not as harsh as an alpinism yeah. type of environment. And my personal coaching ratio is about one to five, meaning when we're, when I'm looking at organizing an athlete's schedule and things come up, they don't sleep really well for a couple days in a row or the weather is crap for a few days in a row one out of every every five of those instances or maybe two out of every five of those instances i'm telling them just to suck it up just suck it up get it done you need some adversity training well it's not going to be the perfect training day out there you'll kind of get it done the other three or four out of five times i'm reorganizing it to to suit a more ideal outcome for the particular workout or for, or for the particular phase. And that's because I know during race day, you know, unless they're doing something kind of off the charts from an FKT perspective, or we know they're going to be in a really challenging environment, <laughs> it's not going to be so off the wall that they're going to have to have a super honed skill set in that, in, from that perspective. It depends on the level of the athlete. That's true too. Yeah. All right. There was some perspective from a recent coop cast with Kareem Ramadan and to, to, to my point with, uh, uh, with Mark's question, he didn't know this podcast was coming out when he submitted this question. So anyway, it was rather ironic that, uh, it just happened to come up in the next week, but to wrap this up, I really want to focus on two things that Kareem went over uh, during the course of his particular answer. And this really brings the practical element to the answer to this question. The, the first one is this, this, this statement of, well, you need to do this every now and then. And we tried to focus on this or refocus on this through the latter part of this answer. Well, how much does this, how, how often are you actually doing this? And I think for any normal athlete in a normal situation, normal ultramarathon athlete, you're training for a 50 mile event, you're training for a hundred mile event, you need to do this on the order of maybe twice a month. The upper end of that would be four times a month. I don't think that doing it any more than that offers any sort of other kind of concrete uh, advantage. To Kareem's point where he works with all these alpinists that are in a constant state of uncomfortableness and constantly challenging themselves, they need to incorporate that more in training and they naturally do so because of the environment that they're in day in and day out from a training for, from a training perspective. So the frequency needs to match what the athlete is actually trying to accomplish. And I think that for most athletes in most normal situations of a frequency of about two to four times per month is really all you need to do to deliberately focus, uh, focus on. The second thing is it needs to be very conscientious. You can't just go out and make the training hard. That's something that you can do, but it's not as simple as that. And here's what I like to do with my athletes is I like to look at what are the things that they are potentially going to encounter on race day that they are going to have to overcome? And the training has to be reflective of that. So going back to my example with, uh, as I mentioned earlier, with UTMB, one of the challenges that is realistic in that type of event is really shit weather. The weather there changes constantly. The same could be said for uh, uh, for Hard Rock, or maybe even Leadville on uh, on some years. And so, absolutely, when the weather is crap, every so often, I'm going to tell them just to go out and suck it up. It doesn't I don't care how much it's raining. I don't care how cold it is. I don't care how much it's snowing. Go out there, test your gear out, get comfortable being uncomfortable because you might have to experience that on race day. And we're going to, part of training is you're honing your entire skill set, not just your physiology, 
you're honing your entire skill set for what you are going to encounter on race day. The same could be said for heat or some sort of other low point. But the point is, is if you're if you're designing your own training, you have a realistic viewpoint of these are the potential things that I that I could encounter on race day. What am I going to do in training to overcome them? Those are typically not the failure points, because when you get to them on race day, you have some sort of recollection of going through that type of adversity and training. The failure points on race day are when you're faced with something that you have not faced on uh, in a training day and that you have to overcome on the fly. And sometimes you have the wherewithal to overcome that and sometimes you don't. So to wrap it up, the frequency of this type of adversity training, I think is on the course of a few times a month for most reasonable people. And I think you need to be deliberate by which you do it in terms of what type of adversity are you introducing? Is it a difficult environment? Is it simply making the training hard? Is it working through a low point? Is it working without a particular piece of equipment that you are so leveraged to leave your phone at home, leave your pack at home and take handheld water bottles? I mean, those types of things, I think when you do them deliberately in training, when you encounter something that's remotely similar, during a race, you are less likely to have that be a big failure point or a point where you could actually underperform. So thanks a lot for that for a lot for that question, Mark. It's something that a lot of athletes are going through. And I think a lot of athletes that either underperform during their key races this summer or DNF during their uh, key races this summer that had one of those particular failure points, they're thinking about how they can adjust that moving forward. All right, so that wraps up this question. I'm going to take a quick break and come back to the next one. Okay, this next question comes, it's really an alchemized question from Twitter uh, that I put out there. And it has everything to do with this really, this really particular nutrition situation of separating your calories from your hydration or whether or not you want to combine them. And so I'm going to go through a couple of different flavors of this. You'll have to excuse the pun. And then I'm going to try to alchemize the answer into, into, into one cohesive narrative. So Robert on Twitter asked, 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 what are your thoughts on separating your calories from your hydration for ultra racing and for long, long runs of over 30 miles? I've always used a combo of tailwind and water and gels to carry with me. I'm just curious of what your thoughts are. Thanks. And then Peter has a question that's just kind of in the same vein, but it's really based off of advice that he's heard from uh, other athletes in, in interviews. And he says, a few athletes have mentioned in recent I Run Far interviews that they went with liquid calories in high altitude environments. You're, meaning me, usually a proponent of separating the two. So I'm interested in your knowledge on this topic. So both of these kind of get at the same thing is should you try to combine your calories and hydration into one source? And usually that's a heavy, a, a more calorie heavy drink like Roctane or maybe even concentrated Tailwind or something like that. Or should you separate your hydration from your calories? And Peter is correct that I am more of an advocate of separating your calories from your hydration. And here's why. While it is true that a lot of athletes can get away with combining their calories and their hydration into one source and get away with all liquid calories for a particular period of time, that only works. It only works when the temperature is in your favor, meaning if your fluid replacement requirements are exactly such that they are going to be matched with the calories that you're taking in from that fluid, that's when that works. And there are conditions, they're mainly cool conditions, with which that works. That is not always the case, particularly in very hot environments. And the classic example that I always bring up is when you're in a hot weather environment, such as Western States or bad water, or any of these hotter weather races where you have to take in a liter of fluid an hour based on your fluid loss, uh, uh, based on your fluid losses. If you're drinking a drink like Roctane, which is 250 calories per 16 ounce serving, 
Simple math will tell you that you're taking in 500 calories an hour if you're using Roctane to replace all of your fluid and deliver your calorie needs. There are very few athletes on the planet that could that can tolerate that amount of calorie intake. Now you might say, okay, well, what if I went with half Roctane and half water? That would be a reasonable strategy, except for the fact that now you're diluting the sodium concentration of all of the fluids that you're taking in and you run the risk of having low blood sodium or getting hyponatremia. So I'm not an advocate for combining these two sources unless the environmental stars just align such that your calorie intake can be perfectly matched with your fluid intake. We started with a clip from the most recent Coop cast. And as irony would put it, I interviewed Roxanne Vogel, who is the head of Goo Energy Labs Research and uh, Development uh, Department. And I asked her this very question specifically about that Roctane drink. Let's go all the way back to Coop cast number two and hear what Roxanne had to say about this particular topic. No matter what the strategy is, even if they're fat adapted, they're still taking in calories during a race. Like sure. it's not mutually yeah. exclusive by any means. And so I always, as you do, I'm sure advocate training your race day nutrition while you're out there on your long runs, um, getting as comfortable with it as you can, even down to like which flavors work for you in different conditions, because that is a thing that people don't realize is, you know, it's hot outside and maybe your favorite flavor is sea salt chocolate, which is mine, but not when it's 85 <laughs> degrees. Like, not a Western state. It's rock dangerous. Right. <laughs> so you might want to go with like a lighter citrus flavor or something that's going to be lighter on the palate and encourage you to want to take in more versus something that's going to kind of sit there like a chocolate. And you're like, oh, man, this is just not the right environment for yeah. this at all. I, so. tol I totally agree with that. Yeah. OK, that was Roxanne Vogel from Goo Energy Labs. And before I start out with this last piece, I'm always I'm always remiss not to mention I like Roxanne. She's great. She's fantastic. I love the people over at Goo. I've known Brian Vaughn, their CEO, for a long, long time. And in fact, I didn't I, I didn't re I didn't realize this until I was just listening to that. Uh, I got a hold of a lot of the very first batches of Roctane that they produced. And they came in these, you know, gray cans with these white labels. They were just kind of R&Ding the flavors and things like that. And the flavors were horrible to like start out with. You could barely stomach it. But they were pitching it at the time during this R&D process as the only thing that you needed during endurance events and, and ultra endurance events. And thankfully they smoothed the flavors out and they actually are, are great now, but they continued that line of marketing through kind of throughout the launch. And that was my original contention with this question is that if you're pitching this from a marketing perspective as the only thing that you need during an ultra marathon event or an ultra endurance event, you need to couch that with, it's the only thing you, you can get away with it being the only thing if these conditions exist and that was to roxanne's point of the context is key to which i will say yes the context is key but the main context is the environmental context and so in order for liquid calories to be your only source of calories to work out you really have to have this right constellation of environmental conditions to exist to which the amount of fluid that you're replacing is going to exactly equal the number of calories that you're going to need. And that is so very rare. It happens. Certainly it does happen. That's why you see athletes that are able to succeed on liquid calories alone. But it's so very rare that I don't think that that is the right approach to start with. So what I think is the right approach to start with is to think about how you're getting your body to re to how you're getting your or how the nutrition that you're providing to yourself from a hydration perspective to be put in your bottles and the nutrition that you're providing to yourself from a caloric perspective to exist outside of the bottles yes you're going to get some calories in a in, from that particular drink for if you're as long as you're drinking some drink with kind of calories if you're not taking a noon or plain water or whatever but if you set up your drink to be to serve the purposes to serve the primary purpose of hydration the caloric content of that drink is going to be somewhere on the order of 80 to 100 calories per 16 ounces or 500 milliliters 500 milliliters so that's a product like scratch labs like osmo 
Cliff has a very similar uh, product to that. I'm not endorsed by any of those. Those are just my favorite three that I always go to. And what that allows you to do is to go through a liter or a liter and a half per hour in those really hot conditions and not tip yourself over the caloric requirements or, the, or your caloric needs that you would have to take in. So you can take in a bottle and a gel or a bottle and some chews or a bottle and a bar or even two bottles, which would be 200 or 160 calories and a gel, which would total 250 calories at that point. So I don't, so to, to, to summarize all of that is first off, you need to have a strategy for how you're delivering your hydration and you're deriving that from how much you are sweating in different environmental conditions. And I've written a lot about how to do this sweat test. I'm going to leave links in the show notes for the listeners that are out there that want to go do this at home. I recommend doing, doing a sweat test to figure out how much you sweat in about 10 degree increments at home during training. That needs to be the foundation for your hydration strategy and the foundation for your caloric strategy can start with how many calories are you getting from those bottles and those different environmental conditions. And then you're adding calories on top of that. And ultimately what that enables you to do is to independently regulate how much fluid you're taking in from the amount of calories that you're actually doing. You want to be able to independently regulate those variables because as I mentioned in the setup question to Roxanne, in most ultra marathon settings, you're going through a wide temperature range. And because of that wide temperature range, your hydration needs are going to, are, are going to uh, change as well. And so if you start out from this premise that I'm going to get all of my calories from whatever's in my bottle, your, your calories are going to be inherently tied to what it, whatever is in your bottles. And it's going to fluctuate with how much fluid you are trying to replace. And you don't want that. You want to be able to independently regulate both of those variables as you go along. So have a strategy, first and foremost. Second, I think it is a better, I think it is a better setup to separate your hydration from your calories, which you get from uh, your bottle should serve the purposes, primary, primary purposes of hydrating and what you have in your pockets, your gels, your chews, your bars, any homemade goodies and things like that. Those should serve the purposes of fueling. So thank you guys for the questions on Twitter. Really appreciate those. That is a really common one because we do see this play out a lot, especially in the elite fields for whatever particular reason where they're trying to get all their calories from their bottles. And I think that that is a mistake that a lot of athletes and in particular, a lot of new athletes make because they can get away with it in a very narrow temperature range. But once they have to deviate outside of that temperature range, that particular strategy starts to fail. All right, folks, that is it for this episode of the Coopcast. I really appreciate Mark and Robert and Peter for submitting those questions through my SpeakPipe channel as well as through Twitter. If you have any questions that you want on uh, that you want answered on a future edition of the Coopcast, go ahead and submit them through that SpeakPipe channel or the voicemail that I have set up. Links to that will be in the show notes, or you can just hit me up on social media. I will be compiling another Ask Me Anything. I really do like the, this format because uh, most of you, most of you, most of the longtime listeners are aware that I have this weekly forum on Instagram uh, where, that I call Wednesday Wisdom. I have a hard time saying that for whatever reason. And I get this huge variety of questions, including the one that Mark mentioned from the onset of what is my long longest long run need to be. And I always poke fun at it. And I'm sorry for the people that, uh, that submit that question. I have to poke fun at them, but it really is becoming quite cliche now, but I really do enjoy that format. I enjoy answering questions because everybody out there, they always have something specific that they want answered. And my goal, one of my goals as a coach is to just proliferate the knowledge out there so that everybody can succeed in their ultra marathon goals. So I appreciate all of you guys out there as always. This podcast is coming to you ad-free, sponsor-free. That is a commitment that I made before I even interviewed Roxanne on the second episode of the Coopcast that I would always keep this podcast ad-free. And that is because at the end of the day, I am a purveyor of advice. And just as I went through on the nutrition side, I can recommend or not recommend 
whatever products I want to because I'm not inherently tied to any one or the other from a financial perspective. You can help this podcast out by sharing it with your friends. You can subscribe or you can leave, leave a rating or review on iTunes. I really appreciate all of those. As always, you guys, I had, a real, I had a lot of fun with this and I will see you out on the trails.